Tonight we're going to feature a young lady from Platte City. Yes, I know. All the way from Platte City. <laughs> Ashley Beamer, who will be attending Northwest Missouri State University here in just about two weeks for her first year of college. And she is hoping, auditioning and hoping to be in some of the choirs up there. Ashley is an All-State student this last year. And we're going to feature Ashley now on the song, Word of God Speak.
thank you everyone. We've sure enjoyed our four nights here. Thank you to Bob Cadowitz on percussion, Terry Blanton on guitar tonight, Kevin Johnson on bass, Peggy Harmon on piano, and all the singers and the praise team. And at this time, could we have John Danny come up? And as in the last few nights, John Denny comes to us all the way from Edgerton, Missouri. Where John is the pastor at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Edgerton. And he's going to come forward and share a few words with us tonight. So we welcome John. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I always appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about what God has done. That he's the one that we've been focusing our attention on tonight as we've been seeing these words. And so I want to welcome you to come together tonight to be able to be a part of the changing hearts of the crusade, to be touched by the Word of God as we're reminded of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. For those of us who are already followers of Jesus Christ, of the mission that He has placed us on to serve Him with our lives, to take the good news that we've received and to give it to anybody who will listen to us. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ here tonight, that this is the, this is the good news, that sometimes I wonder why we talk about anything else, because this is, this is ultimately where everything is headed, and that is an eternity with God, that this world is, is passing away. That everything that has to do with this world will one day be gone. It is all temporary. And our relationship with God is all that matters. So I'd like to lead us in prayer, ask God a blessing on our time together, and then I'd like to share a word of, of my testimony. So Father, we come tonight, we come to you, the one whom we worship, the one about whom all these songs are praising, adoring, exalting, lifting you high, reminding us that you are the one for whom we are made, that all things are held together by the word of your power, that you are the creator, creator, the sustainer of all that is, including every one of our lives. And so Lord, we praise you because you have loved us so much that you sent your son into the world to redeem us, to reconcile us to yourself so that our sins could be forgiven and that we could ultimately live as citizens in the kingdom of God, living for you and for not, not for ourselves. So Lord, help us tonight as we hear your word proclaimed. I pray that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, whether that is to receive the forgiveness of sins, or whether that is to walk in righteousness, to take up the mission of Christ and to live it out faithfully with every day that you give to us. Whatever the case, Lord, help us. We need it and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, to tell you a little bit about who I was before I came to Christ. I became a Christian in, in October of 1991 and before I became a Christian, the first 22 years of my life, I lived in rebellion against God. That I was a, uh, I was a chameleon. And you know, a chameleon has that remarkable ability to be able to adapt itself visually to its circumstances. And that very aptly describes my life. That I was very good at, at showing people what I thought they wanted to see. So if I was around family, I could be what my family wanted me to be. If I was around my friends, I could be who my, I thought my friends wanted me to be. When I was at school, I could show them what I thought they wanted to see. So that's how I lived my life. I was just, I was a different person all the time. I was just, I was, I was deceiving everybody around me and I was, I was deceiving myself. But, but you know, I wasn't the victim. I was the one who was perpetrating this against everyone around me because ultimately my motivation was that I wanted what I wanted. And whatever it took in order to be able to get what I wanted, then that's, that's what I did. I was a manipulator. I was a deceiver. 
And it was all so that I could get what I wanted out of life. I was the person that, if you're a parent here today, that you warn your daughters about. I was the kind of person that I got everything that I could from you, but gave very little back to you. I was just the epitome of selfishness. So as I made my way through life and, and was getting by oftentimes on these, uh, this chameleon attitude, this chameleon lifestyle that I was living, I came to see Christianity. I came, I came across a lot of Christians. I, I went to church when I was uh, a little boy. That There was a church bus that went through our neighborhood picking up kids. And I would go to church, and, and I would go to the activities that they had. I would go to Kite Day, and Hot Dog Day, and Friend Day, and all the different events that they would have. And I would hear the message of the Gospel, but I never came to the place where I was willing to, to turn away from my sin and turn to Christ. So, when I was about 22 years old, I came across a, a book. And I picked up that book totally misunderstanding what that book was about. Because I had come to the place that I, I had pictured Christianity as basically being uh, a crutch. That it was something that people who lacked the courage to face the difficulties of life, that Christianity was what they needed. That they needed a God that they kind of created outside of themselves in order to be able to deal with the harshness of life, the difficulties of life. And so in order to cope, they created this imaginary God, much in the same way that little kids would create an imaginary friend. So I saw this book, and this book was called The Seduction of Christianity. And I thought that what that book was about was that it was about how Christianity seduces people into this mindset of, of this God that people needed in order to be able to deal with with the difficulties and the harshness of life. And so I thought that it was a book about how Christianity seduces people into believing in this God. But the reality was the exact opposite. That the book was written by a Christian. And that the book was written because there were so many people who called themselves Christians who just did not know the Bible. That they were cultural Christians. That they had grown up as Christians, that they had, they had, they had called themselves Christians, but they really had no idea what Christianity actually was. That they were, that they were biblically illiterate. That they were biblically ignorant. That they might go to Sunday school, they might sit under a lot of sermons and do that year in and year out, but that they had very little discernment had very little ability to be able to differentiate right from wrong. That if somebody sprinkled on some Bible verses on the top of it, that they just kind of assumed that it was biblical and that it lined up with what the Bible had to say. But people really didn't know their Bible. So what was happening in the late 1980s and early 1990s, because this was 1991 when I read this book, was that the Christian church was being seduced by something called New Ageism. People were, were believing lies and didn't even realize that they were believing lies. As a matter of fact, people were believing the oldest lie that there was in the universe. Because what is the oldest lie? The oldest lie is the lie that Satan told to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that is that the reason that God doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because He knows that in the day that you eat thereof, that you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. And that's what New Ageism promotes. It promotes the idea that we're all gods, that we all create our own reality, we all control our own reality, we all determine our own reality. And I had come to believe that myself. Because after all, as a chameleon, you determine your own reality. You create your own reality. And I had come to believe the lie that I was my own God. And so, the man who wrote The Seduction of Christianity, his name was Dave Hunt. 
basically spent the first half of the book showing why there was no reason to believe that every person is their own God other than wishful thinking. That there is no rational, objective basis for believing that people are their own God and create their own reality other than people want to believe. So, during the course of the book, I remember that it quoted a verse from Scripture where it says that the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but instead they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, teachers who tell them what they want to hear. And I asked myself for the first time, is that what I've done? Have I just listened to people who have told me what it is that I want to hear? Because when I looked at it, I had no reason for believing the things that I believed. I had never asked myself, what if the things that I believe simply aren't true? Instead, I'm, I'm living in a fantasy world. I'm living in a world of my own creation. I'm living in a world that is comfortable for me because it allows me to do what I want to do. And all of a sudden, there was this intense feeling of guilt and conviction that came over my soul. So the second half of this book, The Seduction of Christianity, this Christian who had just taken everything that I believed and basically dismantled it and tore it apart, starts presenting what biblical Christianity really is. That if, we're, if he's calling the church away from these seducing beliefs, then he had to call the church to what the Bible actually says. And that is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that humankind rebelled against him. And that God has always had a plan of redemption. That it has always been the plan of God that he would send his son into the world to redeem the world that needed redeeming. And that if that world would turn away from its sin and embrace His Son Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior of the world, that God would take their sin and place it on His Son Jesus Christ. And that He would take the perfection of His Son Jesus Christ and place it on them. And that He would cause people to be born again if they would just put their faith and His Son, Jesus. Well, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning when I read that portion of the book. And I realized that I could, I could pretend like I didn't just read what I had just read. Or, I could acknowledge that what I had just read was absolutely true. And that I could cry out to God and ask Him for mercy. So that's what I did. I went into the bathroom and I knelt down next to the bathtub. And I cried out and asked God to forgive me. And I put my faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And at that moment, everything changed. Everything changed. That the chameleon that I once was didn't suddenly instantaneously go away, but I was suddenly instantaneously forgiven for being that chameleon. And in the days and the weeks and the months and the years that passed since then, God has, has graciously convicted me, given me the power by His Holy Spirit to change and to become a different person from the one that I was when I knelt down next to the bathtub that day in October of 1991. By God's grace, I stand before you today and I am not the same person that I was. And it's not because of me. It's because of the God who saved me, the God who loved me, and the God who has been working to change me hour by hour, day by day, year by year, ever since then. And so since then, since that day back in 1991, I have had the absolute delight since then, I have, I have married the woman of my dreams. She's a Christian, and she's known the Lord Jesus Christ since she was four years old. And 
we've been married coming this September for 23 years. We've had the joy of having two children, a 14-year-old now and an 18-year-old now, that we've had the delight of raising in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Something that I did not have the privilege of, but I've had the privilege of, of being a dad to Stephen and to Rachel. And I've also had the joy for the past 18 years of, of serving the Lord Jesus Christ as a pastor. So glory to God in the highest for great things He has done. So if I could offer anything to you tonight other than my testimony, I don't want to preach a message outside of what our brother Jimmy is going to preach. But I would say this, that you don't get cleaned up in order to take a bath. You take a bath in order to get cleaned up. And that's a beautiful picture of the gospel. That you don't, you don't change your life in order to come to Christ. You come to Christ and He changes your life. Amen.
want to say just a couple things. I'm here. Come here. Just listen. I'm not asking you to speak. Just listen. Okay. <laughs> this community is very blessed to have someone like Daryl who is willing to take give me the hand. I didn't ask him to speak. <laughs> he is willing to take the talent that God has given to him and not only to use it in teaching your children over the years that he has done, but also to put together the choirs, the concert choir, uh, the little groups, the big groups, that his family with the uh, uh, kindred spirit, and the list was on and on and on and on and on and on. And I guarantee you there's not a person in Platte County who knows more ministers than this man. I'll guarantee you. I'll guarantee you there's not another person in Platte County that talks to as many different ministers as this man does. I'll guarantee it. Yeah. And I'll guarantee you there's not another person that's called more people concerning the changing hearts of your seat say that this man has this time and does every time we do this. And so, Daryl, from the bottom of my heart, and for all of the people in the community, we love you and we thank you for your service to our awesome God. I just have to say one thing. I appreciate that comment, but we do it because we love the Lord and we want to spread the word. And as we've heard these last few nights, and we know our country is in trouble. And the only way we're going to solve it is to get back to the Lord and for all of us to get back there. And it starts with all of us, just like we talk about in every one of our meetings and we organize the crusade. It starts here and now with all of us. And that's the way we're going to get back there with this country. So, thanks, Jenny. I appreciate it. Thank you. I am so glad and happy and rejoice in the different churches in an event like this to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that in the gospel of John, we have recorded Jesus praying for you specifically? Isn't that a marvelous thing? Listen to these words. This is in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. He had just prayed for his disciples. And he says in verse 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. God has given to you and I the responsibility to be the reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words, in the world in which we live. It begins right at home. If you have small children, or if you're a grandparent, small children in your family, have you taken the book of Proverbs and sat down and began to share with them the book of Proverbs, talking about life? Better. Have you knelt beside their bed and allowed your children to hear you Talking to God? You better. We are His witness right at home. 
We are His witness in our community. We are His witness in our nation and around the world. Jesus said, I revealed you to them. I have revealed to them your glory. And then He says, I want those who have given me to be with me where I am. Now listen to these words in Revelation. John Given the eyes of heaven, God revealed to him the things that were going to come in the future. And here in chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying and no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and they are true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God. He will be my child. Father, Thank you, thank you, thank you for telling us where we came from, why we are here, and where we're going. Father, I pray tonight that our ears would be open, our hearts would be sensitive to your word, the Holy Spirit will be able to do his work in our hearts and minds, convicting us of the sin in our lives convincing us that this is the absolute truth, the very words of God, and drawing us close to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I was very uh, interested in hearing uh, Brother Denny as he gave his testimony as each evening uh, the ministers sharing their faith. I think it's a wonderful thing for people to share their testimony. To let you know you're not the only one that's well, going through some of the trials you've gone through. That you're not the only one who had to make a decision and find yourself facing God. And I appreciate so much tonight hearing Brother Denny as he shared his testimony. I am reminded that we today, in our modern day, have, uh, have seen the testimony of the church change, have we? You see, it used to be that the church influenced the world. The church influenced politics. The church influenced education. Now, I'm not saying that we were out there, you know, pushing our way through. I'm saying that when people know the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God is dwelling and living in that individual's heart, that person, wherever they go, taking God with them, makes a difference. When there's a Christian in a classroom, it's a better classroom. When there's a Christian where you work, it's a better place to work. And the church had an influence. But today, the world influences the church. Tolerance. We're not giving out a challenge anymore. But we talk about getting along. How the private beliefs 
of individuals supersedes what God's Word says. We live in a world that's very confused. Our churches are hesitant to act, unable to give that witness to the world that Jesus prayed that we would do. We have a Christianity that is very comfortable and it demands very little. The consequences of sin, for the most part, in most people's lives, it has been removed. Sin has been normalized in our culture today. For most people, they don't even know what sin is. Most, even in church, are so used to sinning and getting away with it that they forgot. In Romans chapter 1, it says that God's wrath is being stored up for the day of His wrath. Now, for a few moments, I want to share with you a brief history of our English Bible. Because I think it's important, we've talked about the Bible, we've talked, talked uh, in general terms the last few nights about our Scripture and the importance of it and having it in our hearts and in our minds. And I know that sometimes, I think today, because we go to the bookstore and we find 25 different translations, you know, I mean, it's this, that, the other, and go on, go on, go on. And, uh, well, which one's right? You know, you ever think that? And uh, I grew up, like most of you probably, King James. And uh, when I began to read uh, other translations, I began to understand it just a little bit better. And, of course, they revised the King James now about 14 times, and we have the new King James, and... And uh, it's for some, you know, it's King James or nothing. But I'm here to tell you a little bit of the history of our English Bible. And the reason why I want to do this is I want you to understand this is the absolute truth. And we have external evidences all around us. Open your eyes. We have internal evidences all around us. It's in the book. But how do we trust this book? How do we know? The translation into our English language that it's right. Let us begin understanding that the Old Testament Scripture was first penned in Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, most of you are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Just to give you a little bit of background on that, 1947, a little boy was watching his family's goats, sheep, out in the Judean wilderness. Now, if you've ever been to the Judean wilderness, you wonder what the world do those animals eat. I mean, it looks like it's nothing but sand. But there is a little tiny grass. you got to get down close and look at it. That little tiny grass grows and it's high in protein. And they know where to take their sheep to find that grass with that high protein. Well, this little boy, while the sheep were grazing, the goats are missing you know, messing around, what do little boys do? They throw rocks. And this little boy, like every little other boy, he picked up a rock and he started throwing it across this little uh, ravine. And he noticed over on the other side of this ravine there was like a dark hole. So he started trying to hit that dark hole, throwing into it. As he threw one rock into that hole, he heard a crash. So he went over to the <laughs> He found Clay jars about three foot tall. They would have been the water jars of years ago. And inside these water jars were all kinds of objects. He took some of the things that looked like old paper, papyrus, back to his grandfather. For some time his grandfather used it for fire starter. As time went along, an Englishman happened to be in the area as an archaeologist. He came across some of these things that he saw that were starting fires with. And he knew that that was old Hebrew. So he asked questions and found out where it was. Now, from 1947, 48, 49, 50, up into the early 50s, 
It took several years before people began to realize this was a tremendous find. In fact, it's probably the greatest literary find in human history. Because it was not just one cave, but there at Qumran, where this particular uh, boy was at, and uh, in Qumran, that's where the Essenes, uh, that was a group of the Jewish people at that time, who kept copies, making copies, of not only the Old Testament scripture, but also other documents. And so, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, about a third to a little more than a third were Old Testament documents. The interesting thing about it is, when they're compared to the scripture today, you're reading exactly what was copied hundreds of years ago. So the Old Testament, we have many proofs. And uh, today, there's not just like 11 caves at Qumran. There are caves down at Jericho that have been found. There's about 400 caves where these things have been found now. And in Jerusalem, there is a museum uh, to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there are hundreds of hundreds of hundreds that have not even been investigated yet. There is so much documentation, literary finds of the Old Testament. And like the book of Genesis, there's like 20-some complete copies of the book of Genesis. And, and, and I, I mean, it's just amazing uh, these things that have been discovered. Hebrew, Aramaic, the book of Daniel, the New Testament was written in Greek. You've got to remember that Philip uh, bringing up the Greek uh, military and its government, and Philip pushed uh, and brought all the little city states together, if you remember your history, formed the great mighty nation of Greece. His son, Alexander, used that formation of that uh, mighty nation, building an army, conquering the known world. And one of the things, because as he was conquering nation after nation after nation after nation, that he wanted was a common language so he could talk to the people and tell them what he wanted. And so the Greek, the classical Greek, uh, it, they changed it. It was called Koinea Greek. And so it became the common language for the soldiers, and it became the common language all over the known world at that time. Now, it would be much like today, if you live in China or India or South America, and you want to trade on world markets, what language do you need to know? English. You need to know English. Well, that's the way it was then. If you wanted to be involved in commerce, you needed to know Koinia Greek. So, God prepared a common language so that when this book and these events in this book took place, that first century, it went around the world. We had a common language. We had the peace of Rome. We had roads that were being built by Rome going from one nation to another. It was one of the few times in history that people could travel from one nation to another and not... Well... They did it freely because of the Roman peace. So God prepared, what's the Bible say? In the fullness of time. He was born of a woman. God sent His Son to the world at the right time that He had selected. Well, the trade language made it possible for the Scriptures to be uh, used and as a common language so that the Gospel could go quickly around the world. Translations, though, became necessary. All the way back to the days of Daniel, Aramaic, translations for the people. It's called the Targum. And Jesus and His disciples, and I don't know if you realize this, but Jesus, the common language of Jesus, day every day, just out there working uh, as a carpenter, it would have been Aramaic. He would have known the Greek language because that was the trade language. In the temple and in the synagogues, they spoke Hebrew. So Jesus, along with all the other people in the land of Palestine and Israel at that time, they would have spoken at least three languages and possibly even more. But after Alexander's conquest, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. It was called the Septuagint. And this made the entire Old and New Testament uh, available to the people in the common language. But now Rome was in charge when Jesus was here, and their language was Latin. And the earliest translations 
of the Bible from Greek into Latin came from Northern Africa. The Vulgate by Jerome. It went into the Coptic languages. It went into Europe. And the original scriptures were, you know, we didn't have a printing press. Printing press wasn't around until around 15th century. So at this time, people were copying by hand. And they were writing it on papyrus. They were writing it on uh, baked clay, uh, clay tablets. They were writing it on uh, wood. They were writing it on stones. They would often write it on copper. And so we have all these, these different materials, but they didn't last very long. So copies had to be made on a regular basis. And so that's what was taking place. Now, the Bible contains about 750,000 words, three-quarter of a million words in the Bible. That's a lot of handwriting to keep things going, right? Now, many of these old copies have survived. The Bible manuscripts, in other words, copies, we don't have the original. But we have many, many copies. Most of the copies are from the 9th to the 15th century. But we are discovering more and more from the 1st and the 4th, the 3rd, and even the 2nd century. And there is a copy today of the Gospel of John that they estimate to only be 20 years after the original. Uh, now this is what to me is so wonderful and shows me how God protects His Word. When looking at all of these old manuscripts, and uh, we're talking about thousands of them, looking at these and comparing them with, with our Bible today, 95% of the Bible is exactly like it was then. And the manuscripts, in comparing them to each other, is more than 95%. I mean, it's, that's a huge factor when you're talking about people writing things down by hand. You've got to remember that the Bible was penned by 40 people, at least, over a period of about 1,600 years. And now God has protected it so that when you read it, you can count on it. It is the truth. Now, the reason why it's not 100% is... It's not in the areas of doctrinal issues. There are no discrepancies. It is in the areas of people copying. And so there would be little, but there's small, minute details. The first uh, printing press uh, in the 15th century and the first Greek New Testament was printed about 65 years after that. Now, this is the part that it will help you to understand our different translations. You remember Rome divided. The West and the East. Rome and Italy, the West. Constantinople in the East, the Byzantines. Now, in Rome, they spoke Latin. When the King James was translated in 1611, it was from those copies that they had from the Western part of the Roman Empire. There was about a hundred copies that the King James came from. The Byzantine Empire continued to use Greek. So they have much older translations. That's why I say we're not just from the 9th to the 15th century now, but we're back all the way to the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. And so that our newer Bible translations today, like uh, uh, New International Version, uh, the New American Standard, and on and on and on and on, they're coming from these older manuscripts. Does that make them better? Not necessarily. You got to remember, translation is to get the Bible into a, the language so the people can understand it. But what I want you to understand is, someone is not just making up things. It's coming from thousands of copies of old manuscripts. And so this, you know, and I am so thankful that there are people who have given their lives to study and to learn these things. But our old English Bible. In the year 1100 and back, it was called Old English. Now, you remember in your high school in Bay Wolf? I never did quite understand it. Do you remember that? In, in, in high school English, Bay Wolf, and uh, they talked about the Old English. You, you can even, I mean, you can read it, and you know what, what it said. But then from 1100 to 1450, we have the Middle English. From 1450 on, we have Modern English. But our, our English language is one of the hardest languages in all the world for people to learn. 
And it is a language that's constantly changing every year. You'll have a list of new words that are put in the dictionaries, right? So it's constantly changing. John Wycliffe, he translated from Latin to English and written the Bible. Martin Luther, German translation. William Tyndale, he was from Germany, 1526, translated the, uh, from the Greek into the English. And uh, in 1535, he was arrested and burned at the stake for what he did. Did you know that? That the people who first translated the Bible that you read into English were burned at the stake for what they had done. King James, he brought together in 1604 a group of people and he said, I want you to put the entire Bible in the English language. In 1611, it's completed. Before that, we have the Geneva Bible in 1560. And this is the Geneva Bible that the, uh, uh, when the Mayflower came over with the pilgrims, that's the Bible that they had, the Bible that they used. And uh, with all of the translations, just remember that the King James was from about 100 copies, uh, different copies, manuscripts, but today we have 5,500, 6,000, 6,500, thousands of manuscripts. And so, as our language has changed, you can still count on it. Uh, the last hundred years, the revised, uh, the first revised vision of the King James was in 1881. Uh, the American Standard Version, 1901. Revised Standard again in 1952. The New RSV in 1990. The Good News Bible, 1976. was a Bible that was written primarily for people whose uh, first language is not English. Then we have the New American Standard, the NIV. I like, I like the NIV. I like all of them. But uh, 1973, 1970, 1973 was only the New Testament. And in 1978, it was complete. Uh, accurate. Uh, our modern English translations, the New King James, 1979, the New Testament, 1982, uh, it was completed. Uh, we had the 10th revision of the King James. I just wanted to share with you a little bit of information so that you know this is in your language, in words that you understand, the very breath of God. You can count on it. It's the absolute truth, and it's the perfect Word of God. Now, sorry I had to give you the history lesson. This is a 1973. There's only 100,000 copies of this made. This particular one uh, is made with real thick pages. And it's written in paragraph form. And it's like reading uh, letters, like the way it was originally written. And I got this book, this Bible, in 1973. And uh, I never put my name in it. And uh, just a few weeks ago, for the first time in my life, I laid my Bible on top of the car as I was moving some things. And uh, I backed out of the garage, turned down the road, went to the post office in Carlin, and I drove over to the airport, and I went to Platte City to the grocery store, and then I came home. And as I walked to my desk to get my sit down, I wanted to do some reading, I couldn't find my Bible. And then it hit me. I laid it on top of the car before I left. I spent the entire day looking for this Bible. I mean, I cried. This is my reading Bible. This is the Bible that I go close the door and sit down and listen to God. And 42 years of notes not commentary notes, my notes. And I lost it. Seven times I drove that route that day. When Carol came in, in fact, I'd left a message on her phone. And uh, she got so mad at me because I told her it was awful. It was a tragedy. And, you know, tears in my eyes. And she thought, one of them, What's, what, what, which kid? What happened? And I said, no, no, no. It's my Bible. I lost my Bible. And she, so she, then she sympathized with me a little bit. And so she drove while well, I held my head out the window looking. I thought, maybe if I could just find one page, I could find this thing. And then she had this great idea. I am not much on computer stuff. I am not much on social media. But she says, I think you need to let people know. And I said, well, no, tomorrow I'm going to place the sheriff's department and 
and let them know I'd already got into contact with the uh, people who mow the, mow the roadways and, and asked them to be looking for it, you know, and, and she says, uh, no, she says, so she uh, emails or texts my daughter-in-law, uh, Ashley, and Susan Anderson, and they put it on Facebook, and uh, before long, over 6,000 people were looking for my bike. <laughs> And would you believe in less than an hour, we got a phone call. A lady had found the Bible and called another lady, and that lady called me. She said, I think we have found your Bible. And so uh, the lady left it at the post office at Farley, and I got the Bible. And she said, uh, there's no name in it. And I said, no, I never intended to lose it. <laughs> and uh, I got a whole, I, I've got to few pages that are loose coming out, I'm going to have to rehab. It's been re-glued three times, so I'm going to have to glue it again. But I just want you to know the Bible you have, you can trust it. God has protected it. And you can trust it. And when you read it, you read it as though God is talking to you. That's important. Because one of the other things I said we were going to talk about this week is God's wrath. You know, the church doesn't talk about hell very much anymore, do we? When you go into the Bible, do you know who talked about hell more than everyone else put together? Jesus. Jesus gave us more information about a place that is eternal, that is physically felt punishment, he gave us more details about hell than all the rest of the penmen and the people that are mentioned in the Bible. I'm figuring if Jesus had that much to say about it, we better pay attention. Now to remember what Pastor Denny said this evening about salvation. you understand what salvation means? It means to be rescued. To be rescued. You remember we have talked this week about the fact that we are guilty before God. Because of the disobedience and the rebellion of Adam, the sin nature has been passed through generation to generation to generation. You are born with it. You come into this world guilty. And the only thing that's going to change that is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's the only remedy to your problem. So when we read this, the external evidence, the internal evidence, you can know that it is the truth. And no one comes to know Christ without either hearing or reading this Word. No one comes to Christ by watching someone be a Christian. I mean, it's important, yes. You come to Christ when you have the Word of God in your mind and the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to convict you of your sin, convince you this is the truth, and wash you, regenerate you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation is a rescue operation. That is 100% the work of God. You're a sinner and you're incapable. It's impossible for you to do anything that would satisfy the offended justice of God. There is a place called hell. And it is a place where those who do not repent, do not believe, do not trust in Jesus Christ, will spend eternity. Now, it would be impossible for me to cover all the information that's in the Scripture, so I challenge you. Get you a concordance, start looking up the Scripture, start reading it, and when you read the Bible, you do it in such a way that you've got a notebook beside you. And you write down every time you have a question, you write that question down. Because this book will answer that question. You just got to keep it's like digging for gems and gold and silver. It's hard work, but that's what you need to do.
do. And when you pour God's Word into your heart, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Against the holy character of God. That's the importance of this book. And God has preserved it. And God has allowed it to be put into the language that you and I speak. Into words that you and I can understand. And we can read it knowing that this is God talking to me. Talking to you. Read it as though it's a personal letter to you. From God Himself. That's what it is. Now, I'd love to talk more about how many, how many would like to come back tomorrow night? That's what I'm <laughs> Four nights. Is awesome. But I'm always reminded of, I think it was in, was it in Corinth that Paul was there for a year and a half? Was there some place that Paul rented a building of one of the universities for two years? It says that he preached and teached and taught the Word of God every night. And it says that everybody, every person in the whole area came at one time to hear the Apostle Paul. There were more people converted to Christianity, receiving Christ as their Savior in the first century than any century since. Oh, we're kind of lazy, aren't we? We kind of want to do our own thing, don't we? Yeah. Well, brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed, ignorant, about those who sleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died. Jesus rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who sleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now what we're talking about is Christ is coming back. The King is coming back. From the Old Testament, we have many prophecies. From the book of Daniel, God gave to us the outline of the history of the world from that point forward. Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Greece, Rome, that ten confederation of nations that will be at the end of time, that will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Gentile nations of the world. Their history was given to us. God gave to Daniel that the, the, uh, the uh, Messiah would appear and in 483 years, and He did. Did you ever wonder why or how did the Magi know that it was time for the Messiah to be born? Well, you've got to remember, Magi were around for a long time. They're mentioned way back in the Old Testament. You see, the Magi were the educators of the kings. They were king makers is what their responsibility was. And David, being part of the organization of Babylon, and being part of Nebuchadnezzar's entourage of, of uh, high learned people who were his advisors, when God gave to Daniel the outline of the ages, I'm thinking He probably shared that with them. And when they understood 483 years the Messiah would be born, they saw the kind of glory of God, we call it a star. I'm not sure everybody saw the star, but whatever, if it was a star or whether it was just the glory of God, they followed it and they ended up in Bethlehem. And just as God said, the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. So the nations of the world have Israel still here. But Israel over the years has not done anything without permission from some Gentile nation. And uh, now Israel has kind of regathered herself back 
in her land, but it's not nearly as big as the land that was given to uh, Abraham. It's, it's very small, in fact, but it's there. And the time, uh, that, that as we read the uh, what's going to be like in the ends of, of the days, uh, it, we're seeing these things happen right before our eyes. I mean, go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel said at the end of the ages, things are going to be very fast. Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, up until a couple of hundred years ago, they rode horses. Now we ride airplanes 600 miles an hour across the country. Or, you know, we, we've got stuff going up into space. I mean, speed is a big deal. Just to let you know how fast things are going. At the end of World War II, knowledge, information, doubled about every 13 years. You know how often knowledge... Information doubles now about every three days. It's getting pretty fast. It's getting pretty fast. So all of the things that God has told us were coming. Read what Jesus said. Because, you know, the disciples, they asked Him many times. Let's look at one of those real quickly in the book of Acts. Uh, this is when the Lord Jesus, this was after His death, burial, and His resurrection. He was here on the earth for 40 days. We have the time of the, what we call the, the day of Pentecost, where the church was established, when the Holy Spirit came and permanently indwelled the believers. And you've got to remember, that's that transitional period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Jesus told them, you go back to Jerusalem. Well, let's read. He said to them, well, let's look here, for on, on verse 4. Uh, Acts chapter 1. On one occasion while he was eating with them, I like that. Jesus was in his new resurrected body and he was eating. And he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Go back and read John uh, 14, 15 and along in there and you'll see that Jesus told them he was leaving, but he was not going to leave them comfortless, that the Holy Spirit would come, and it's of the same essence, and that's why we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is not just the power of God, it is God. Pronouns are used to describe Him. God the Holy Spirit. So He told these men, you go back to Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now... For you and I today, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And when you trust Christ, when you confess your sin, when you repent of your sin, and you acknowledge Christ as who He says He is, and you invite Him into your heart, you receive salvation, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the family of God. God sees you through the righteousness of His Son. You are in His hands. And when people talk about losing their salvation, you can't not lose your salvation. If you're saved, you're saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't make a mistake. And when God does His work, you cannot lose your salvation. You're saved by His power, not by your power. You may fail. You may backslide, you may fall into sin, you may... In fact, what did the Apostle Paul say? I do what I don't want to do, I don't do what I want to do. Remember that passage in the book of Romans? You remember the description that he used? It's like carrying around that old body, that old dead weight, that old uh, sin nature on his back. You remember that? The people at that time clearly understood what he was saying. You know why? Because the Roman government, when someone was convicted of murder, the Roman government would, would often, when they, when they knew without a doubt that guy killed that guy, they'd take that dead guy and put him on that guy's back and tie his arms to his arms, tie his legs to his legs. And we're talking about a dead body that this guy, he just murdered this guy. Tie him to his back, arm to arm, hand to hand, leg to leg, put his head right up there, tie it to him tight. You know what happened in a few days? When that dead body began to rot, you know that was a terrible way to die. Because that was the sentence of death on the murderer. And he died from the decay and the rot of the body that was tied to him. And Paul said, that's what my old sin nature's like. It fights with it. It struggles with it. And so do you and I. 
And we have the Holy Spirit. If you'll just listen to Him. And I'm telling you right now, you can't hear God unless you read this book. This is how God speaks to you. And you can trust it. It's God's Word. Well, Jesus told you to go back here and you wait. And then He says after this, uh, oh, they, they ask Him this question when they met together. They asked Him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's a good question. I mean, they remembered the Old Testament prophecies. They remembered what was said, that the Spirit of God would be poured out upon the people and they'd have a new heart. They knew about the miracles that were going to be, uh, be performed. They knew Jesus was dead and now He's alive. Is this now the time that the kingdom's going to be restored to Israel? This is what Jesus said. It is not for you to know. It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father is set by His own authority. You don't need to worry about it. He's coming back. He may come back tonight, tomorrow. I don't know when He's coming back. I know He's coming back. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord, you got to remember, His return is in two stages. The first stage, we meet Him in the air. We just read that. The second stage of His coming, He comes all the way back to the earth, Zechariah 14, and His feet land in Israel on the mountain, and the mountain is split east to west, a wide, brand new valley. The first half of His coming, if you and I are alive, we're gone, there, changed in the twinkling of an eye, a body like His, equipped to live in the presence of God forever. When he comes back, guess what? You and I are going to be with him. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Uh, oh man, I don't have time to read everything on the way. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on them, but no one but he himself knows. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him. That's your name. We're coming back with him. Riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nation. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh has his name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus came the first time as a lowly servant. He came to seek to save that which was lost. He came with the purpose of dying. Shedding the blood of God for the remission of sin. He's coming back as judge. I saw a great white throne in Him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from His presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. My friend, I'm here to tell you tonight, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have not asked Christ to take your heart and change it, this second death is where you will spend eternity. And you've got to remember, it's not going to be in spirit form here, that everybody will be resurrected. You'll stand before the great white throne. You'll bow on your knee. And you'll and yes, you'll agree with God. He has the right to cast you into eternal damnation. The only ones that are going to be there are the ones that never repent. Never repent. 
never believe, never trust. I'm telling you right now, the church has got so really mealy and weak in its testimony, the world is dying without hope. It's time for us to get into this book. I've tried to explain to you as simply as I can. You can trust it. This is the truth. It's perfect. And when you read it, it'll tell you exactly where you came from. It'll tell you why you're here. It'll tell you what to do. And it'll tell you where you're going. You're going to live forever. You're either going to live in the presence of God or you're going to live in hell. Jesus described it as a place of unending torment. He described it as a place where you, you know what it's like to be thirsty when you're out working and your mouth just gets so dry you, know, you just need to swallow water, right? That's the way it's going to be forever. I'm telling you right now, you go, you just study on your own what Jesus said about eternal damnation, eternal judgment. The church doesn't even want to think about it anymore. Doesn't, doesn't even talk about it. Don't you understand salvation is a rescue plan? Our work is to rescue. I can't save anyone, but my responsibility is to take this book and to share it with you. That's our responsibility. To make sure that your family, your neighbor, your community understands and knows this book. It's their choice. I can't save them. You can't save them. The Holy Spirit does that. But it takes this book. When we speak, we speak as though we're speaking the very words of our Savior. Jesus said to the disciples, I'm giving you authority. And that, was, that meant a, a 100% representation. When the disciples spoke, they were speaking the very words of Christ as though Christ were speaking. And that has been passed down to the church from generation to generation. And it is our responsibility. We are to speak as though we're speaking to the Lord Himself. Uh, I want to close with my I can preach all I love to sometime. I'm afraid y'all get up and leave. I'm telling you right now, I love this book. And I want you to love this book. I want this book in me. I want to be a reflection of who Jesus Christ is. I mean, I work on it every day. I, I pray about it. I struggle with it. And so do you if you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior. Because I'm telling you what, I still have that sin nature. And I still fight it. And I, what did Paul say? It's like I fight it. Punch it. I'm going to hit it here. That's what Paul described it. He says, it's like a war. It's hard. And if the apostle Paul had trouble with it, I don't stand a chance. <laughs> Man. I want to share with you, this is my favorite. I mean, I love this whole book. But every time I read this, every time I read this verse, you know what I want to do? I want to get on my knees. I want to put my face on the ground. I want to say, oh God, how could you love me this way? Listen to this. Revelation 22, the angel showed me the river. He's showing John, the Apostle John, this. Through the eyes of heaven, the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, down the middle of the great street in the city. Do you know how big, how big the house is? I mean, you know, we got all kinds of songs to talk about. A mansion on the hilltop. There's only one house where we're going to live in heaven. You know that? I may not be right next door to you, but uh, we're all in the same house. Did you know that? You know how big this house is? The book tells us the house that you and I, Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you so that where you are, where I am, you can be there with me. That's what he said. And in the book, of Revelation, it tells us how big this house is that Jesus is preparing these rooms for us. It's 1,500 miles in that direction. I'm standing on a corner, and I look that way, 1,500 miles. And if I look this way, down the foundation of it, it's 1,500 miles. And if I look up this way, it's 1,500 miles. That's a big building. I read one time when somebody took a piece of paper, I'm not that good at math, 
but he took a piece of paper and a pencil, and he figured out, like, and he even added if the, if the, the, the rooms were 12 feet, I think he decided, instead of 8 foot like we build today. Even if the rooms were 12 foot, he, he figured out how many levels of, of, of floors would be in that, that building that's 1,500 miles high. I'm going to tell you right now, it's a lot. <laughs> And then he took just some average figures of, of the population of the world. I love this part. And the population of the world and used high percentages of people who may, you know, may be uh, true believers, followers of Jesus Christ. And he figures that your room is about 75 acres. <laughs> it's all in the book. In this book are over 4,000 promises that God made to you, to His children. Can you believe it? All that that God has in store for us. No ear has heard, no eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Amen. Wow. Now let me get back to my favorite verse here. I'm not there yet. <laughs> And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nation. Now listen to this. No longer will there be any curse. Genesis chapter 3. Man rebelled. And God said, because you rebelled, you're going to die. And because you rebelled, the earth came under a curse. And when you try to grow potatoes and tomatoes and onions, the weeds are going to take it over. And you go out there and you, if you don't mow your pasture for a couple of years, I don't know where these thorn trees come from, but if you don't mow your pasture every year, they just appear. It's all part of the curse. And by the way, ladies, the reason why childbirth is so hard, go back and read it. It's right there in Genesis. We live in a world that's under a curse. Life is hard. It's terribly hard. And for years now, the church has been promising people because of the hard life that we have. It's been promising the people, you come to Jesus and He'll do this for you. And you'll be able to do this. And you won't have to worry about this. I'm telling you, Jesus didn't come to give you peace. He didn't come to make your life easy. He didn't come to give you good health. He didn't come to make you wealthy. He came to redeem you, to get your soul out of hell. He came to rescue you. And we forgot to tell the people that. And I'm afraid a lot of the people who go to church every Sunday morning don't even know it. They came to Jesus for their own reason. Watch Russia. When the wall fell, big deal, right? Missionaries whoosh, ran to Russia, didn't they? From all organizations. I'm telling you right now, Russian people, in many instances, did respond, yes, truthfully. The majority of their response was, we want what the West has got. They got money, we want money. And if it's that religion, then let's do it. Now they're figuring out that it doesn't work. They will be a much larger enemy than they ever were before the wall fell. You say, what are you talking about? Well, read the book. Talking about the end times, guess what? The armies of the nations of the north, led by Russia. The armies of the nations of the east, millions in their armies. The armies of the south will converge against the west. Now this is during the tribulation. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be enjoying the uh, land supper. I hope you're there too. But if you're not, look out. This is what's coming. And it's going to be world war. We haven't had a world war like this one. This is going to be terrible. The old Antichrist and the armies of the old Roman Empire rebuilt are going to win. Barely, but they'll win. And that's when he turns in the middle of the tribulation, that seven year period, he turns against Israel. And what's left of all the armies gathered together to do what? They just think like people are thinking today. If we get rid of every Jew, guess what? We'll have peace. We'll have peace. Who's behind that? Well, the old devil's behind that. He's been behind trying to get rid of the nation of Israel ever since the beginning. Why? Because if he can get rid of them, there's no kingdom for Christ to come back to, and God is a liar. You think that's going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. In fact, when the Lord Jesus returns, 
Battle of Armageddon. We, we'll be there watching. We'll be there with you. But we don't have to lift a hand to fight. Why? Because by the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the armies of the world will be destroyed. He'll establish the kingdom where all of the promises to the nation of Israel would be fulfilled in a thousand year millennial reign. I mean, we have the Abrahamic covenant, we have the Palestinian covenant, we have the Mosaic covenant, we have the, 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 all the promises that God made to the nation of Israel will be fulfilled in that thousand years. Then when it's over, the devil will be released. I cannot understand how the world will again stand up against God, but they will. For me, it's God's way of proving salvation is His work. And man on his own will never understand nor accomplish that. Then, the old devil, he'll be cast into the eternal lake of fire, and the prophet, the false prophet, and then we have the great white, great, uh, white throne judgment, where all who have rejected Christ, who have never repented, will be cast eternally separated from God. Now my favorite verse again, no longer will there be any curse. The old order of things is gone. The Bible says that God's going to roll up the universes and it's going to all be new. No sin. No sin nature. No more curse. And the throne of God of the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need a light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. And the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and they are true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent His angel to show His servants the things that must soon take place. And Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon. He's coming back. He's coming back. The question is, are you ready? That's the question. Are you ready? I would do anything, I would do anything if it would ensure your rescue. All I can do is what we've done the last four nights. Give you His Word. And I'll pray for you. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. I don't understand free will. But I know that you and I both have the freedom to choose. And if you do not repent and you reject what this book says, that's your choice. It's still the truth. And someday you're still going to die. And after death judgment, you will stand before the one who gave you life and your guarantee. I pray, if you've never asked Christ to come into your heart, do you understand now when we talked so much this week about sin, the consequences of sin? Sin's a terrible thing has to be dealt with. And the only way you can get rid of the consequence of sin, unbelief, is to trust in Christ Jesus. So as the musicians are coming, they'll sing the invitation song. I'd ask for everyone to please stand. As they sing this invitation, if you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never repented of your sin, coming down that aisle, that's not going to do it. But I'm telling you right now, it's nice to have one of the pastors, any of the pastors that are here, can please come up. And if anyone comes forward, I'll take, take your Bible and they'll share with you and pray with you. If you've never picked up the challenge, doing everything you can to thank God for saving your soul, you want to make a difference. You want to go back to your church, whether it's a big church or a little church. You want to go back and you want to make sure that the people understand what it means to serve the Lord. I would say that if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you have read your doctrinal statement in your church in the last year, be very few hands. Do you even know what your doctrinal statement is? I'm telling you right now, folks, you have a great responsibility. You are His witness. You are His witness. If God is touching your heart and you want to make a difference, 
come down here and pray together. Our churches are important. All of them are. No matter if it's two, three, or ten, or a hundred, or two hundred people, it makes no difference. God doesn't deal in numbers. He deals in people. Come. Come tonight. As they say.
and we all want to do this because of the sacrifice you made through your Son, Jesus Christ. We lift all this up to you through His name, Lord. Amen. 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 Alright, please join us in singing the Changing Hearts Crusade song one last time. <laughs> 